Amen. Open your Bibles this afternoon to the book of Ephesians, please. The book of Ephesians. I'm going to read a few verses in chapter 1, but mainly spend our time in the first 10 verses of chapter 2. I was listening to Pastor preach this morning, and uh, just he talked about and used several verses uh, that I will be referencing uh, this afternoon, and uh, just uh, thank the Lord for the, the way I believe the messages today were meant to be harmoniously preached together. Whether I do a good job or not, uh, the text uh, is going to go along with what Pastor was saying this morning, so I'm thankful for that. It's also a little bit of an extension of what I preached on Wednesday evening. It's totally fine if you weren't able to catch that service. Uh, I believe this, uh, this sermon today will stand alone, but we'll be uh, in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. I was wondering as I was preparing for the message today, if you remember your first experience with the concept of death as a child. For, for some of us, no doubt, it could have been, you know, maybe there was a bunny who lost its uh, mom and dad bunny in the backyard, and so you were trying to keep that, that bunny alive by, you know, feeding it milk or giving it a piece of lettuce, or perhaps it was a baby bird that fell out of the nest, and inevitably, as much as you tried and your parents tried, a little creature ended up dying, and, you know, you had a, a little shoe box that you crafted into a coffin, you even had a little memorial service, and I mean, we did that a couple of times with different things, had a hamster that died, and that concept of death became real. I remember that as a child, and it uh, seems maybe a bit silly now, but back then when you were faced with death, and it was a, a serious thing, and pro- probably now, uh, as you have grown and gotten older, uh, we've experienced death in a very real way, right, where we've lost uh, a loved one or uh, someone that uh, was very close to us, and we know uh, that that grief is very real and very strong. I was passing by the Dundas Valley, and I know we have several of our former members that are buried there. Uh, I remember several funerals there, and I began to think about people who had passed away, and you know, we miss those folks, right? We do miss them. Uh, we know we have all the, the hope of Scripture and, and uh, the spiritual side of it. We're excited that we'll get to see them again one day, but it doesn't mean that death doesn't hurt and that we don't have pain. Uh, we don't like death. You know, and I don't think we should. We shouldn't like death. I like that God uses some metaphors on purpose in a way that will stick out and grip our minds. He often uses word pictures to do that, to help us understand truth and realities in ways that are clear and powerful, and hopefully, of course, beneficial, and in a way that results in understanding and decision and change. And that's surely true of the word death. One of the comments that the Lord uses in Scripture to describe people like you and me was that we were dead in trespasses and sins. That's a pretty strong metaphor. We were dead in trespasses and sin. Now, I don't necessarily like the the way that analogy sounds. Essentially, it's like a room full of coffins, right? We were dead in our trespasses and sin. But thankfully, the story does not end there. There is hope and uh, surely that word death is, is one of those metaphors that stick out in our mind. I'm glad that's not the end of the story. So here in Ephesians, we're going to read chapter 1, verse 18 to 20. And this is a prayer uh, by the Apostle Paul. And then we'll read chapter 2, verse 1 and 10. But I just want the preface of chapter 1, verse 18. And I want you to look at Paul's prayer here. He said, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of the call, the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he was raised from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places now one of the ways that that prayer can be answered is through understanding why we needed his great power, why we needed that, and how he demonstrated that great power to us, and perhaps most importantly, why he did it, or what impact he desired it to have on us practically, this great power that he talks about. So look at chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. There's the phrase. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And we 
heard about that in the Malazzo video, didn't we? That witch doctor grandmother who's clearly uh, under the, the power of the devil. We were all of that, that nature, the children of disobedience. Okay, verse 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I never, ever tire of reading that passage. Never tire of it. And it's always such a wonderful truth for us to see. I wanted to visit this passage because, as I said, on Wednesday night, I had a sermon uh, that I preached on unity. And I referenced this passage a few times for just a little bit. And we talked about the process of salvation. We talked about what all of us brought to the table for salvation, which is only the sin that necessitates it, right? We don't, we don't bring a worthiness to salvation. We bring this great death, this great emptiness, this great void that requires and is in need of the righteousness of Christ. So this afternoon, even though this passage is before what we looked at Wednesday, I want us to review just for a few minutes this afternoon some principles that help us give attention to the purpose of our salvation. So if you're a note taker, that's what I would write at the top. Some, some principles for that, that will help us to give some attention to the purpose of our salvation. Why are we saved? So number one, think about the nature of our depravity. Uh, it's, it's not that I have to emphasize this. The scripture emphasizes this, right? The depravity of man is a, a doctrine that scripture teaches. It's good theology. It's not fun theology. It's less popular as our world becomes more modern and more liberal and more away from the principles of scripture. But indeed, Ephesians chapter 2, Paul begins through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to take us down to the, to the dark valley of the soul. And then he all of a sudden takes us to the, to the he heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. There's this, this enormous contrast between uh, death and life. And it, from heaven, from hell to, to heaven, from bondage to freedom. I think that's why I enjoy reading the passage. There's this great contrast that we can participate in from, from pessimism to optimism. It's, this journey's contrast has a way of enhancing our appreciation for what we have in Christ, and it influences, it should influence, the way we live. So think about the depravity of man. This begins when we're born spiritually dead. The scripture says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in your trespasses and sins. That does not mean, or it means more than we do sinful things. It, it's not, we're not talking about actions, we're talking about nature. Okay, so we were not dead because we had committed sin, but because we were in sin. So, okay, so in this case, in this context, trespasses and sins, they don't refer to simply the acts, they refer to the sphere of existence, so you don't become a liar because you lied. You lied because you were a liar, okay? You, you didn't come a, be, become a thief because you stole. You were a thief because of your nature. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. And this is confirmed in many places in the scripture. Uh, just for a couple of instances, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 35, Jesus said, an evil man out of his evil treasure bringeth forth what is evil. In Matthew 15, 18, he says, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Verse 2 makes the condition even starker. Because we are children who are, he hath quickened us, but we were walking, literally walking in disobedience. Ephesians 2, verse 2. Wherein in time past ye have walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince 
of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now we see the spiritual battle that is being waged, which is why a few chapters later uh, we read a, a well-known verse in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 that talks about we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and uh, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Then Paul adds this crucial piece of information. It's essentially indulging the desires of the flesh. Among Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. That makes me think of James chapter 14, uh, verse, or excuse me, James chapter 1, verse 14 uh, and 15. That talks about when we're, every man is tempted, when we're drawn away of our own lust and enticed. And then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. Death and sin, they're all always related. And that vivid picture of death, God is using to bring apart, to bring about to us, not a pretty picture at first. But if it's true, it needs to be told. If it's true, it needs to be taught. It needs to be affirmed. And how does this dis- the discussion end in Ephesians chapter 2? It says at the end of verse 3 that we were by nature children of wrath, even as others. In what condition were people like you and me and every other human being born? Besides Adam and Eve, <laughs> they were created. We were born dead in trespasses and sins. That's biblical. That's what Jesus wants all of us to know. I'm thankful. By God's grace, New Testament Baptist Church for almost 45 years has affirmed this doctrine when many others have not. I was on our website doing some maintenance the other day, and I was just going through our statement of faith and what we believe. And by the way, if you haven't done that, it's not an extensive list, but the main doctrines are there. And you can go to ntbch.ca and look it over. But this, you'll find this. This is what we have there. Uh, our views of man and his fall. We believe that man was created in in a pure and innocent state, but willfully chose to transgress the law of God. Due to the first man, Adam's transgression, all men born since are born with a sin nature. That's how we're born, and there's several scripture references listed. I read recently of some mega churches, and it's not just limited to them, but, but they have avoided using certain phrases from the scripture so that they do not be, they're, they're not coming off as offensive. Folks, if you have to avoid the use of scripture, I hope that in our church that would raise a red flag, right? We need to avoid the scripture here. Never. We don't want to avoid the scripture. We may not like how it makes us feel, but we don't avoid the scripture. But they're avoiding it because they don't want this message of God's love to be offensive. Well, there's a wonderful message of God's love in the Bible, but it starts in a very offensive way. And the offense is that we are dead in trespasses and sins. The gospel message is inherently offensive, but I hope that we'll never be ashamed of it. Pastor read in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 this morning, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, there are a couple of upshots to this. Before we keep reading, this is not to say, I think I've said this before, it's not to say that that every person is as bad as they could possibly be. There's a lot of unsaved people who have behaved themselves in a very virtuous way for the course of their lives. I mean, that's true, right? But Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 explains, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. Right? It's impossible to do so, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that is he a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Which means that a good action could not ultimately done, cannot ultimately be done for a right motivation by someone who is spiritually dead. Because I'm like you. I mean, I see people out there in the world, they're doing really wonderful things to help humanity. They're doing really wonderful things to curb hunger and and to stop trafficking and all these things. Those are wonderful and important causes. And as Christians, I believe we have an obligation to involve ourselves in. But they are involving themselves for the reason of doing a good work. And it's without faith. They don't have a faith in God. And it's it's not possible to have a good action that is going to honor the Lord if a person is not trusting him, is not saved. And this doctrine is called... The depravity of man. And as I said, it's not a popular doctrine. I've noticed, and I, I'm not 
super old. Some of you are thinking, you're not old at all. I turned 44 on May the 6th. But I have seen enough of our modern church. There was a time, probably 25, 20, 25 years ago, there was a huge push in my lifetime for the self-love kind of movement. They were talking about the, the, the love of self and self-esteem and self-image days. And it, I'd say 25, 30 years ago. And it was all the rage in secular culture. And it was all the... the the uh, modern psychologists and things like that were pushing this agenda of love yourself and, and love your self-image and all of those things. And biblical Christians had to make a decision of whether or not we were going to stick to what the Bible said about true anthropology, the study of man. True anthropology, folks, is that we're, we're born sinners. We're born dead in our trespasses and sins. And we have many times since had to make similar decisions about whether or not we're going to stick to what, what the scripture says about marriage, about gender, about uh, sexuality, about lots and lots of things. We have to, we've made the decision many times, to, are we going to go with the way of the world or are we going to go with what God says in scripture? One of the up, another upshot till this is until we get some better news. This is why it's so important as parents that we teach our children the law of right and wrong. It is so important for us to do that. Standards of behavior, uh, to teach them attentiveness and obedience. Why? Well, certainly not as an end to itself. We're tempted to do that, right? We just want to teach them to do right so we don't have to put up with the wrong, right? We just want to train them and teach them, just do good. You're supposed to. But I want my children to begin to, to understand this theology, to begin to ask questions like, why, why do I not want to do the right thing, Daddy? <laughs> why, do I, why am I prone to do the wrong? I, I want to do the wrong. We want them to understand this doctrine. We want them to understand this is how we are all born, and this is the answer or the anecdote to fighting that behavior, to fighting that, 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 that bent to the flesh. We want them to understand what Scripture has to say about it. This is why Paul said in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24, he said, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Haven't we heard about that recently, being justified by faith, living by faith? The just shall live by faith. I'm glad that's not the end of the story. So number one, think about the nature of our depravity. Number two, this afternoon, rejoice in God's response to our condition. Rejoice to God's response to our condition. And what is his response? Well, it's his great love. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, and those ought to be some of your favorite words in Scripture, amen? But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, as we all were, hath quickened us together <clears throat> with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I read a moment ago uh, from our statement of faith on our church website, the section on the fall of men, but that wasn't the end of the story. Let me read you a little bit more of our statement of faith that you'll find on our website. It goes on to say regarding salvation, we believe that God's redemptive grace of forgiveness and eternal life is a free gift through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This redemptive grace forgives us of all our sins, past, present, and future. We believe that, the, it goes on to say, we believe that true salvation requires biblical repentance such repentance is the working of the Holy Spirit, convicting of sin, and a need for a Savior. True salvation is for whosoever will, by faith, confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Once someone is saved, they're justified before God. Such justification includes the pardon of sin and the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. That means you were dead in your trespasses and sin, but through your faith, you have been justified. And you now have the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God the Father, the one who we need to be concerned about. We're righteous in his eyes. I get goosebumps even in this hot, sweaty stage thinking about stuff like that. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. I was dead in my trespasses and sins, but through the act of faith, believing in what Jesus did for me, 
I'm alive, and I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the substitutionary atonement, heaven for the born again, security of the saved. I hope we never tire of rejoicing in God's response to our condition for his great love. But God, because of this great love and his mercy and his richness of mercy, I believe if you were to ask many of the people in this auditorium, why did you come to church today? Think about it. Why'd you come to the church today? I think inevitably we'll have some, some obligatory responses. Well, I, I just, I know I'm supposed to, or uh, I didn't really feel like it, but I had to be here. But I think many of us would say that I've come to church because of what God has done for me. I've come to church because I love him and, and I, I want to worship him because he chose to love me. And I, I never tire and I never cease to be amazed of God's response to my condition. We need to be reminded of that, folks. I miss the, the freshness of a newborn baby Christian who, who just realized for the first time what they've been saved from. Shame on us who've been saved for 30 plus years that often forget about that. You know, we've enjoyed the luxury of salvation for so long, we forgot truly what we brought to the table. Let, just rehash the gospel in your mind once in a while and remind yourself there's no reason for us to boast. This is how, this is how I got to that point on Wednesday evening in the issue of unity is that none of us brought anything worthy to the salvation table. We're unified in that we are all dead in our trespasses and sins. But through this great love that he loved us, his mercy, we can rejoice and we can be saved and we can be justified by faith. If we've been made alive together with Christ, if I've been raised with him and seated with him in heavenly places in Jesus Christ, well, then what impact has that on our relationship to our desires, you know, because let's talk about practical Christianity for just a little bit. The answer should be that we no longer live for the desires of the flesh. It becomes a matter of what we're feeding, right? Uh, the, the word of God, obviously, is what we should be feasting on. The blood of Christ sets us free from living according to the desires of the flesh. That list of things that Paul contrasts in those first few verses, that this is what we were, were, were before, but here we are now. How do we continue to combat that with Scripture? Well, Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 6. I believe it'll be on the screen, but if you want to turn back just a few pages, Romans chapter 6 this is a good refresher, a good reminder of uh, how this should work as Christians. Romans chapter 6, uh, in verse 5. The Bible says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. <laughs> I like the flip here. <clears throat> we were before dead toward trespasses and sins, in trespasses and sins. Now through Christ, we're dead to trespasses and sins, okay? We are freed from that. Verse 8, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, you, Christian, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. And by the way, if as a Christian you let sin in your life, you're a miserable Christian, and for all these reasons, because you don't have to live that way. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal, mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So do you know what that means? This is no longer a room full of coffins, amen? It's not that way any longer. We are alive now unto righteousness. We can say no to the desires that don't please God and yes to the ones that do. That's the essential aspect of our new life in Christ, and that informs and empowers and guides much of what we believe about Christian growth. You know, the good news is that we don't have to come naturally 
or automatically anymore to sin because, because we're alive in Christ. We've been born, we're not morally born good, where we, we find, uh, you know, joy in pursuing good things. We, when, we're, when we're born again, when we're made alive in Christ, then we pursue the things that honor God that bring great joy. We're born spiritually dead, living in the lust of the flesh. But when beyond that, now go back to Ephesians chapter 2, and let's look at verse 3 to 5. <clears throat> the Bible says, Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. I'm glad that we've been rejoicing in that truth as New Testament Baptist Church for nearly 45 years. But my life, I was, I was born into this particular church style, to, to the Baptist Church, to the beliefs of the Bible. I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for his, his miraculous grace. When you look at verse 7, it says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us, through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we use those verses all the time for salvation, don't we? For grace you're saved through faith. We want to make sure that we're portraying the gospel message. It's not by works. It's not by works of righteousness that, that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Why it's not of works? Lest any man should boast. This is the this is the unifying factor of what we've been talking about. Do you know that you know that you know? In the spirit of sort of being a part two to my Wednesday evening sermon, another upshot of this doctrine and condition that we brought to the salvation process is how it has led to genuine humility and a sense of unity as a body of Christ. You know, we were formerly spiritually dead folks who were only alive now because of the love and the grace and the mercy of our great God and our Savior. Have you noticed, maybe, you, I don't know how, how much you, sometimes when we're praying, we, we sort of rehearse certain statements, and we just almost say them without even thinking. Thank you for your love, mercy, and grace. How many times have you said that in your prayer? Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your love and grace and for your mercy. Yes, we are thankful, but do we ever just say that and just passing and really forget to think about what that means. I mean, I'm glad that I'm in the habit of saying it. I am. But with the habit comes a little bit of a lack of understanding sometimes. I say it just quickly. Father, thank you for love and grace and mercy. Wait a minute. Was I really genuinely thanking him for all those things of which I am a beneficiary? I'm so glad from that. We were formerly spiritually dead people. But now because of that love, we thank him for on a regular basis. Because of that mercy, because of that grace... From our great God, we have absolutely no reason to boast because of it. We have no reason to boast in anything, at any time, in any place. Now, where does that leave us? <clears throat> Squarely in the middle of verse 10. Number three, make adjustments so your life can be productive for him. Make adjustments so your life can be productive for him. Or retool, if you will. Retool if you need to so that your life can be productive. Verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 2. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. How is your workload, Christian? The passage is obviously clear. We're not saved by works. We know that. How is your workload? How is your workload? If we're genuinely saved by grace, if we genuinely have new life, then we will experience joy when we obediently work for the Lord. There's a, there's a joy in serving Jesus. Someone should write a song about that. There's joy in serving Jesus. Joy, joy, joy that throbs within my heart. Joy that, that comes as a result of following the Lord. You may remember at the end of the great resurrection chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I believe you, uh, maybe it was Diane that quoted this at your request on Wednesday night, 1558, 1 Corinthians 1558. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. How is your workload? 
you know, these verses and many more are the reasons for a community-based outreach ministry. It's why we're going to go in a few minutes, Lord willing, and knock on some doors. Why? Because we want to do the Lord's work. We want to do everything we can to let people know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're not boasting about it. We just want to take them to the same water that we drank from that sustained us and gave us eternal life. We're not condescending on others. I, I don't like that impression. Sometimes people get the impression Christians are condescending on our sin. No, we're not. We're just taking you to the same salvation that we found because we brought to the table the same thing that you bring to the table. We are sinners. We have nothing to boast about. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when you're soul winning, when you're witnessing, when you're talking to someone about Jesus Christ, you be sure and affirm that we are all sinners. I'm no better than you. I started right here. We were all born sinners and in need of the grace of God. What are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to live in a way that is consistent with our new birth. Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. What about our commitment to missions? You know, same thing. We're wanting to live in accordance to our new life in Christ. So I would encourage you, Christian, this afternoon to take a serious look at your workload and make sure that you are including in it the things of the Lord. The, the reason that you are here today, the reason that you have salvation, that should be a big, huge, enormous part of our lives. Everything else is sort of the sidelines, the means to the end, if you will. But we're Christians. We're, we're born again children of God, and we need to make some adjustments sometimes. That's what spiritually alive people do. We're no longer dead in our trespasses and sin. We're spiritually alive. And we have the Holy Spirit of God, and we have this wonderful and powerful Word of God with instructions, with, with, with the amazing... I was listening to a guy preach the other day, and uh, he was talking about... I think I, I posted this video on my Facebook page, if you're interested. He was talking about hellfire and brimstone preaching and a need for it. And, and how people say, man, we need some of that old hellfire and brimstone preaching. And I do enjoy some of that. But he's, he made this statement. He said, the Word of God whispered is just as powerful as it is shouted because it is the word of God that has the power. Beloved, are you sharing the word of God? You should be because as a Christian, you're alive in him. You're alive in Christ. You're no longer dead in your trespasses and sin. You have a new purpose and a new goal in life. Everything that we do should be to forward the, and advance the cause of Christ. I'm thankful for the analogy. I don't like death, but I like to remember the fact that I was dead in my trespasses and sin, and now I'm dead to sin and alive to righteousness. Aren't you thankful for that message? Thankful for the wonderful, wonderful mercy and grace of God. Father, we are so grateful, and Lord, sincerely so, for your love for us and your great love wherewith you loved us, that you came to us, that you convicted us, you quickened us. We were quite literally completely unable of saving ourselves and you through the spirit through your word quickened that dead soul and it began to quiver and understand the the plot of itself and lord through the conviction of the spirit and the wonderful word of god lord you've brought to us life through faith lord i thank you for doing that in my own life over 30 years ago over 30 almost 35 years ago when i called upon you for salvation thank you for saving me Thank you for saving those within the sound of my voice. And Lord, perhaps today there's one questioning in our midst whether or not they've truly been saved. Or, or Lord, you've been dealing with them. Lord, continue to work in their heart. Give them the, the, the boldness, the courage to, to come and speak to someone. We gladly show them. And there's not a single saved person in this room who would make them feel embarrassed, but would only rejoice in the wonderful grace that you provide for all of us. Thank you again. Now we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for your attention today. Is there anything we need to announce, Pastor, before we dismiss? <clears throat> okay. Yep. If you're able to stay today, it'll probably be about 15 minutes before we go out uh, and knock doors. So if you're able to stay, uh, if you could let us know um, right after church, that would be very helpful. And we can make plans from there, okay? In fact, come to the, come to the front after uh, if you're able to do that. Anything else? Don't forget about the hits. Now, one, one question about that. We listed the things for the kids. Um, did you mention there's something else, like the bikes, I heard, but is there something else that the hits need that we need to be uh, thinking about? Okay, the dining room chairs and the bikes, but nothing besides that that you know of. Just if there's something you think of that could be a blessing. There's plenty of room, if I'm not mistaken, right? 
Okay, and when does that go out? When do you need to have it by? Can we stay Monday? All right, so you can bring it Sunday if needed, right? Okay. I'll send out an email to remind everybody. And the link that he, Pastor, mentioned about the Atwell Center, the Formula for Hope, I sent that out like 30 minutes before church started this morning. Uh, so you should have it. And it's important you use that link uh, because it's tied to our church. So I guess it's not super important, but our church has set a goal of $2,500 to raise. So uh, if you click that email link, it will take you to the New Testament Baptist Church donation page, and you can give that way. Anything else?